is the sixth lecture. I uh, so last time we introduced this concept of conditional probability, and we saw how to calculate it directly and how to manipulate it using the tower rule. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is develop some more techniques about useful ways of manipulating conditional probability. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing in this first part of the course is just figuring out how to take information about certain probabilities and translate that into information about other probabilities. And so what we're going to be discussing in this lecture is a technique called Bayes' rule, which lets you exchange between different probabilities using knowledge about conditional probabilities. And there's two versions of this rule, and we'll kind of divide the lecture into two halves based on the two versions of this rule. Okay, so the first version of Bayes' rule that I want to discuss, I'll call the total probability version, because this version is designed to calculate total probabilities as opposed to conditional probabilities, in the sense that this rule gives you a total probability as a final answer. The other version of the rule will give you a conditional probability as a final answer. And the way this Bayes rule works for total probability is you have two events, which we'll call A and B, and you want to assume that you know the probability of A, and you know the conditional probability of B given A, and you know the conditional probability of B given A complement. So you know the likelihood that A happens, you know the likelihood of B given that A happens, and you know the likelihood of B given that A does not happen. And your goal is to figure out the probability of B. So for this version of Bayes' rule, there's three inputs, probability of A, and these two conditional probabilities for B on A and B on A complement. And what you want to do is you want to figure out from this the probability of B. And the formula that you want to stick in your head for figuring out probability of B given these three inputs is probability of B equals probability of B given A times probability of A plus probability of B given A complement times probability of A complement. So essentially you're recovering B by canceling out the conditional probabilities. And we can derive the main formula that's highlighted in the teal using the sequence of equations that's listed below it. So we can take either side of the plus symbol in the teal highlighting and apply the tower rule to each of those pieces. So the simplest case of the tower rule for two events gives you the probability of the conjunction as the probability of one times the conditional probability of one given the other. So we apply this two event case of the tower rule on both sides of the plus symbol in the teal equation. And we get the probability of B and A plus the probability of B and A complement. And then from that, we can say, 
Well, since A and A complement are mutually exclusive events, taking an extra conjunction with B can't possibly create any overlap between them. It's like, if you have non-overlapping things and you're picking out two special subregions, that can't possibly create any overlap. So, since A and A complement are mutually exclusive, we can say that B and A complement is mutually exclusive with B and A, and so we can apply the mutually exclusive additivity axiom to combine probability of B and A plus probability of B and A complement into probability of B and A or probability of B and A complement. So, oops, got this symbol upside down here. All right. So now that we have this plus symbol turned back into a disjunction symbol, we can say, well, if you think about it on a logical level, the disjunction of B and A or B and not A is logically equivalent to B and A or not A. So we can replace probability of B and A or B and A complement with probability of B and A or A complement. So A or A complement is certain, so we can replace that with the entire sample space, and then taking the conjunction with a certain event just gives you the original event back again. So probability of B and sample space is probability of B. Okay, so you can see here how we've managed to derive the Teal formula, and we're going to refer to it from now on as the total probability version of Bayes' rule. So this total probability version of Bayes' rule is something that you want to remember not just in the sense that you could copy it out, but you really want to have it on the front of your mind as something you can actively recognize in situations where it might be slightly obscured. Okay, so let's see an example of how we can apply this total probability version of Bayes' rule. So let's consider an example where all cats are either lucky or unlucky. So a lucky cat has a 40% chance of winning the lottery, and an unlucky cat has a 20% chance of winning the lottery. So if 30% of all cats are lucky, what is the probability a cat selected uniformly at random wins the lottery? Okay. So you can see I have the solution written out at the bottom here, but let's try and go through a thought process of how you could look at this word problem and come up with a solution. So you can see that there's really two events being discussed here. There's an event where a cat is lucky, and then there's an event where a cat wins the lottery. So the first thing you want to do is to set down what the events are that you're dealing with in this probabilistic model. So let's define an event A where 
a cat is lucky and then let's define an event B where a cat wins the lottery. So our sample space is all of these cats and we have two events. We have lucky cats and unlucky cats dividing it into A and A complement. And then we have cats that win the lottery and cats which don't, dividing it into B and B complement. All right, so we know that the two events we're considering are this event A where a cat is lucky and this event B where it wins the lottery. And so what we can do is we can say, what information about probabilities in these events is given to us in the question? And what information are we asked to obtain? So the question says that a lucky cat has a 40% chance of winning the lottery. So the way we want to interpret that is to say that the conditional probability of winning the lottery, given that a cat is lucky, is 40%. Or in mathematical notation, we can write the probability of B given A is 4 over 10. And then we can say, all right, so we're told that an unlucky cat has a 20% chance of winning the lottery. So, um, we can say that can be interpreted as given that a cat is unlucky, the conditional probability of winning the lottery is 20%. Or in mathematical notation, we can say that a cat being unlucky is the event a complement, and so the probability of B given a complement is 2 over 10. And then the last piece of information we want to extract from the problem is that 30% of all cats are lucky and we're selecting a cat uniformly at random. So what that tells us is that all cats are equally likely to be chosen and 30% of the total population is lucky. So we can use the uniform probability formula to say that 30% of the cats fall in the event of luckiness. And so the probability of a lucky cat is 30%, and in our mathematical notation, that works out to probability of A is 3 over 10. And then we're asked to find the probability a cat selected at uniformly at random wins the lottery. So that is just the event B, where we're trying to figure out the probability that a cat wins the lottery without making any additional hypothesis about its status as lucky or unlucky. So we can see we've got conditional probabilities for B on A and B on A complement, and we've got the probability of A. And so if you have those three things and you want to know the probability of B, that's exactly what the total probability version of Bayes' rule is supposed to do. So if you look at what I've got at the second last line of the page, that's exactly copying out the Teal formula from this slide that we derived. And so we can plug in our numbers for all of these events. We have um, conditional probability of B given A is 4 tenths times 3 tenths, which is the probability of A. 
and then we're adding two tenths, which is the probability of B given a complement, times the probability of a complement, which is one minus three tenths. And this works out to 13 over 50, which is 0 0.26. Okay, so we can have a look at a slightly more sophisticated example of how to um, use this total probability version of Bayes' rule. So let's consider a game in which I start by choosing a heads bias P for a copper coin that I manufacture. So um, maybe I'm putting some extra alloy in it and I'm manufacturing this coin and part of the game is that I get to choose my alloy for this coin in such a way that I can specify its bias towards heads however I want. So I manufacture myself a copper coin and I get to specify the probability that it lands on heads. Okay, so then someone else gives me a gold coin with a three-fourth heads bias and I flip that gold coin. Then I flip my copper coin and I win the game if it matches the gold coin. So how should I manufacture my coin to maximize the chance of winning? So this question is asking us for a probability, but it's not asking us directly to calculate a probability. Instead, it's asking us to figure out what probability we should set for the coin we manufacture in order to maximize a certain other probability. So we need to set up an appropriate relationship between probabilities. Now, this is a question where it's designed to be such that the answer is intuitively obvious. And sometimes I think those kinds of examples are really useful in probability theory because if you have an obvious intuition about the answer to a problem, it can really be helpful to watch how that intuition plays out when you try and verify it using the mathematical formalisms of probability. And so what I claim is that it should be intuitively obvious that you want to set P to be one. You want to maximize your chance of winning this game by putting as strong a heads bias on your coin as you can. And the reason I claim that's intuitive is because it's like, well, okay, so I know that the gold coin is more likely to end up heads, and so any probability I allow my coin to have tails is unnecessarily sacrificing itself as a waste on the tail side of the gold coin. So it's like whatever probability I put into the tails of my coin is going to be wasted because I need the tails of the gold coin to show up in order to make use of that. And I'm just choosing a bad option if I'm making use of the one-fourth probability for gold coin being tails as opposed to the three-fourths probability for it being heads. So if you are thinking about this game intuitively or, you know, if a savvy gambler who didn't know anything about probability was playing this game, they would 
tell you immediately that you should make P equal to one and put as strong a heads bias as you can on the coin you manufacture. So let's try and give a mathematical derivation for that. So we're talking about two events here. Let's define an event A where the gold coin is heads and define an event B where the copper coin matches the gold coin. So um, the question tells us that the probability of A is three-fourths. So the probability of the gold coin being heads is three-fourths. And then we want to think about the event B as being conditioned on the two sides of the gold coin. So if the event B conditioned on A means copper matches gold given that gold is heads. So B conditioned on A, probability of B condition on A is the probability that copper is heads because you're saying, okay, well, I'm looking at the probability that copper matches gold given that gold is heads. That's just the probability that copper is heads. And similarly, we can say the probability that copper matches gold given that gold is tails is just the probability that copper is tails, which is 1 minus p. Okay, so we have these three pieces of data. We have the probability of A and the probability of B given A is p and the probability of B given A complement is 1 minus P. And we want to try and maximize the probability of B. And we can see that we have exactly the data needed to make good use of the total probability version of Bayes' rule and exchange these conditional probabilities for the probability of B. So we don't have exact numbers for the two conditional probabilities, but we're going to try and use this unknown P as a variable and see what happens. So we can plug in three-fourths for the probability of A and P for the probability of B given A and one-fourth for the probability of A complement and one minus P for the probability of B given A complement. And then we can see this works out to one-fourth plus one-half P. And so probability of B is equal to one-fourth plus one-half P and all we're doing is maximizing that quantity, which is obviously maximized by making P as large as possible. So we set P equal to one to maximize the probability of B. And that conforms with our intuition, which tells us that putting all of our weight on heads for the coin we manufacture gives us exactly the same chance of winning as if we just flipped the gold coin and any other distribution of weight for our copper coin is a suboptimal strategy in this game because it gives a probability less than three-fourths which is less than what we could do if we just sync up our copper coin to the gold coin as much as we possibly can. So if you set P equal to one, you get the probability of copper matching gold is three fourths, and that's the best you can do. The best you can do is to make the event that copper is heads certain, and then rely on the gold coin having a higher probability of heads.
Okay. So, there's another version of Bayes' rule, which is also very important, and I also suggest you stick in your memory not only as something you can copy out, but as something your eye can catch slightly hidden in situations where it could potentially serve as a useful tool. So the inputs for the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule are the same as for the total probability version. You know the probability of one event, A, and you know both conditional probabilities. So you know the conditional probability of B given A and the conditional probability of B given A complement. So these are the same things we assumed we knew in the total probability version of Bayes' rule. But in the conditional probability version, instead of trying to figure out the probability of B, we're interested in figuring out the probability of A given B. So the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule is kind of like a reflection thing for conditional probabilities. It allows you to reverse the direction of conditional probabilities. Of course, it's not as magic as letting you figure out A given B only from B given A, but it lets you figure out the probability of A given B where you have a decent amount of information about conditional probabilities in the other direction. So you know the probability of A and you know the two conditional probabilities of B on both sides of the event A and A complement. And then what you're aiming to do is to figure out the other conditional probability that you want to know the probability of A given B. Okay, and so the relevant formula is what's highlighted in teal in the middle of the page. So the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A over the probability of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given A complement times the probability of A complement. So this is kind of a long formula. Um, it has some symmetry and structure which can help you remember it, like the first term in the denominator is the same as the term in the numerator, and the two terms in the denominator are kind of symmetrical between A and A complement. So I might try and remember it structuring it that way, that I remember this symmetrical formula on the bottom, which was exactly the same thing I remembered in the total probability version. So the bottom of the formula is the total probability version of Bayes' rule, and then I have the first term copied on top, and I'm using this rule to recover the conditional probability in the reflected direction. So we can derive this main formula that's highlighted in teal by first of all applying the tower rule to the numerator. So we can apply the simplest two element case of the tower rule to the numerator in this expression and see that it turns out to be the probability of A and B. So then we can recognize the denominator as the total probability version of Bayes' rule, 
and replace that expression with the probability of b. And then once we've made those two reductions, we just arrive at the formula that defines conditional probability of a given b. So, you know, depending on how your memory works, you could use this derivation as kind of a crutch to help you re walk the path that gets from simpler things to the Teal formula. You could try and remember the Teal formula based on this kind of internal symmetry where there's A and A complement reflected in the bottom and the top is the first term on the bottom. So there's a variety of techniques you could do to try and stick this in your head as something that you know to look for as a useful thing to do. Um, and so the conditional probability if you have the probability of A, probability of B given A, and probability of B given A complement, the two versions of Bayes' rule allow you to figure out the probability of B and the probability of A given B. Okay, so let's see an example of how we can apply this conditional probability version of Bayes' rule. So let's say a class is answering a multiple choice question with five alternatives. Half of the class knows the answer and will get it right. The other half will guess uniformly at random from the five options. If a student answers correctly, what is the probability they actually knew the answer? So, um, okay. So the first thing you always want to do is to write out the events you're using to structure your probabilistic models. So let's say that we have an event where A is the student knowing the answer, and we have an event B, which is the student answering the question correctly. So we can look at what kinds of data are given to us in this word problem. So we can say that the probability of A is one half because half of the class knows the answer and the other half does. So we can say the probability of B given A is one because the question says that if a student knows the answer, then we can automatically assume they're going to get the question right. And then we know that the probability of B given A complement is one fifth because we can say that A complement is the event a student doesn't know the answer. And we know that if the student doesn't know the answer, they're going to guess uniformly at random from the five options. And so the probability they're going to select the right option is one fifth. And we can see we're asked for the probability of A given B. We're asked 
for the probability that the student knows the answer, given that they answered the question correctly. Okay, so you can see we have the three kinds of data points which tell you that it might be useful to think about Bayes' rule. We have the probability of an event, and we have the two complementary conditional probabilities for another event, B on A and B on A complement. So given that we have those three data points, it's a good clue that you want to think about Bayes' rule, and here we're asked to figure out the conditional probability. We're, he, he, here we're asked to figure out the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule, where we want to have the kind of lengthy fraction that was highlighted in teal on the page previously where we derived it. So what I would do looking at this problem is I would say, okay, the probability of A, probability of B given A, and probability of B given A complement, I know that those kinds of data are relevant to Bayes' rule. And then I see, given that I want a reflected conditional probability, I can remember that there was some lengthy formula in the lecture which told me how to find reflected conditional probabilities. And then I would go to look for that formula. So, um, you can see I've copied out the formula for the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule, and um, I plugged in the appropriate numbers for all the probabilities that I deduced from the data in the problem. So the probability of B given A disappears because it's just one. The probability of A is one half, and the probability of B given A complement is one fifth. So we can see this works out to five over six, which is roughly 0 0.833. Okay, so, this type of problem, even if it's hard to keep the full statement of the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule on the top of your head, you can kind of clue in that if you have these three kinds of data points, probability of A, probability of B given A, and probability of B given A complement, and you want a reflected conditional probability, you have a formula for doing that. Okay, so this last example we're going to do is something that's probably harder than what will be on the homework and exams, and I'm doing this example not so much to train you to perform derivations like this yourself, but rather I want you to see this particular explicit derivation because I think it's important to see how probabilistic calculations can be used to come to fairly general epistemological conclusions. And so, you know, this is an example where I'll do some mathematical calculations, and I really want you to think about how these mathematical calculations are reflecting certain ways people deal with probability in 
the real world. So it's a standard principle in forensic accounting that a suspicious pattern can be considered evidence of fraud only if it's more likely to occur as a result of fraud than pure chance. Use Bayes' rule to justify this. So, you know, if you have some company and you're looking at their accounts and they seem to be making a lot of money, you might say, well, are they actually making all this money or am I just looking at a bunch of made up numbers? And there's all kinds of tests you can do to check whether these numbers are made up or likely the result of just a honest, successful business. And the most fundamental principle in checking whether numbers that flatter your business are real is to see whether these flattering patterns are more likely to happen as a result of fraud or as a result of chance combined with some sort of reasonable hypothesis about the underlying situation. So, you know, there are all kinds of patterns you see in accounts that could be construed as su suspicious just because anyone who's dealing with money any transaction benefits somebody, and so there's always reasons to be suspicious about accounting because every accounting transaction ultimately benefits somebody, and that gives them an incentive to lie about it. But if you really want to make a case that this pattern is fraud rather than the result of chance and honesty, you need to make uh, argument as to why the suspicious pattern is more likely to be a result of fraud than a result of chance. And so let's think about how we can go about giving a mathematical justification for that. So let's say that A is the event that fraud exists and B is an event that the suspicious pattern exists. So because this is a more difficult example, we don't have explicit numbers. We need to understand what we're being asked to do in terms of abstract mathematical expressions. And so we're going to interpret the idea that a suspicious pattern is a good evidence of fraud if the probability of fraud conditioned on that pattern is greater than the probability of fraud without knowing that pattern. So conditioning on the existence of the pattern increases the chance of fraud. That's how we're interpreting the statement that the pattern is good evidence of fraud. On the other hand, we're also supposed to think about the probability that, or we're supposed to think about the idea that the suspicious pattern is more likely to be fraud than chance. So we're going to interpret that as saying the probability of fraud, the probability of suspicious pattern given fraud is greater than the probability of suspicious pattern given no fraud. And our task is to assume that suspicious pattern given fraud is more likely than suspicious pattern given no fraud. Or I would say it like this. Assume that pattern given fraud is greater than, if, assume that pattern given fraud is more likely than pattern given no fraud. This makes the pattern suspicious. From this, we're supposed to derive that fraud given the pattern is more likely than fraud without knowledge of the pattern. Okay, so I have a mathematical derivation here. And if you look at the first line and the last line, 
the first line is what the task tells us to assume, and the last line is what the task tells us to deduce. So the first line is what the task tells us to assume. Then the second line follows from the first line by multiplying both sides with 1 minus the probability of A. And then the third line follows from the second line by expanding out the factor of 1 minus PA on the left side and converting 1 minus PA into the probability of PA complement on the right side. Then the fourth line follows from the third line by moving the middle term over to the other side of the inequality. Then the fifth line follows from the fourth line by dividing both sides by the right-hand expression in the fourth line. Then the sixth line follows from the fifth line by multiplying both sides with the probability of A. And then the last line follows from the previous one by using the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule to replace this fraction with the probability of A given B, which is exactly what this fraction is asserted to be by that version of Bayes' rule. So you can see this is a mathematical derivation, and line by line it's just elementary, except for going from the second last line to the last line, where we apply the conditional probability version of Bayes' rule. You know, I'm not saying it would be particularly easy to come up with this derivation yourself, given that you're just told the first line and the last line, but hopefully now that you see it written out line by line, you can verify in your head that this is accurate. And so what we've done here is to use mathematics to justify a certain epistemological assumption that forms the basis of forensic accounting. And, you know, it's, as a theoretical mathematician, this derivation is kind of the only thing I know about forensic accounting, but for a forensic accountant, it would be kind of like this derivation is by far the most mathematical proof in that field. So, you know, different, the importance of mathematical derivations depends on your perspective. Like, a theoretical mathematician just sees them as the basic currency of our subject, and we look for the inherent qualities of mathematical derivations, whereas in other subjects, you take particular mathematical derivations as reasons for scientific principles that are then applied to the discipline. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll have my office hour on Friday at 3 p.m. I also look forward to seeing you at the interactive lectures on Monday. As I said, I have given up on the idea of trying to get students to read their own work, so uh, we'll just have a completely fluid, free-form discussion where students can ask me about homework two and lecture material.